All righty. Good morning, everyone. I'm Eileen Sullivan Marks. I'm Dean of the Rory Myers College of Nursing here to uh, open up and uh, welcome you to uh, this session this morning for Alumni and Parents Weekend. And it's, you know, lovely weather to greet you all, you know, here. So we're the troopers. You're the real New York Cityers who just, you know, come no matter what. And it's not that bad, but, you know, but we're here. And um, I think we'll probably have a few folks drifting in because it might be a little late um, getting here. Hello. And um, so in our audience, I know that there's some, um, I just met some parents, um, alumni uh, who are recent or more long-term grads. And then um, we have several of our faculty um, who will be present throughout the day. And I want to, um, and a member of our alumni board who just walked in, James Seta, Haley Boyce. Hi, there, there she is for alumni. Make sure you connect with the alumni board. I think there's some others around alumni board raise your hands yay there you are so you can um, reach out to them for more information and we have two of our um, we're doing some awardee celebrations later today but we have two of our alumni who are here who are just outstanding and, and getting recognized in several ways this week um, Fran Cartwright who's the chief nursing officer at Mount Sinai so people looking for jobs there she is <laughs> 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 and and bit next to her is Billy Rosa, who's an NYU alum, who's a doctoral student at the University of Pennsylvania. So they're both receiving uh, internal NYU awards today. But later this week, we um, host our American Academy of Nursing annual meeting, and both of uh, both Billy and Fran will be inducted into as fellows into the American Academy of Nursing. So that'll be a thrill um, to have that. So I'm going to move things along and let Carolyn Dorson, one of our family, faculty members, introduce our panel. This is going to be a very exciting program on reversing gender inequality and redefining women's health. Um, we have experts in this area. We're very proud of the work we're doing. And uh, welcome to the podium, Carolyn. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean Eileen, and thank you to all of you um, for being here. It's really such an honor to be here with you to celebrate NYU and the NYU Myers College of Nursing. So 10 years ago, I was asked to give a talk at Alumni Day, and it was um, on the topic of health of older women. I was a new junior faculty member, and I was incredibly honored to be asked to speak at such an important and prestigious event, but the truth is, I was pretty terrified. So I asked my mentor, Dr. Judith Haber, what she thought I should speak about. So being the encouraging and supportive mentor that she is, and if you know Judy, maybe this will ring true for you too, she simply answered, oh, come on, you're a nurse, right? You know what's important to people. Speak about what's important to older women. But then she stopped and she said, but for this event, maybe no sex. <laughs> So you can imagine how the story ends. <laughs> I'm a nurse practitioner, right? I'm a nurse educator. I'm all about getting my hands dirty and getting in there and talking about what's really important to people. So of course, I ended up speaking about sex. <laughs> so today we're here to talk about reversing gender inequality and redefining women's health. And there's a different elephant in the room. There's a part of me that knows it would be wise to avoid talking about the swirl of controversy around women's health in this country and globally. But honestly, it's pretty hard to avoid. We live in such divided times, and like it or not, women's health always seems to be in the center of the political storm. The Kavanaugh hearings, Me Too, Roe versus Wade, trans health, even the awarding of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize to end sexualized violence as a weapon of war and conflict was seen by some as a political act. The list goes on and on. In fact, women's health has become so synonymous with controversy and partisan politics that it is sometimes easy to forget that when we're talking about women's health, we're talking about real people. We're talking about real suffering. We're talking about real people and real quality of life. We're talking about real people with real challenges and real triumphs, with real families and real complicated multi-dimensional lives. It's also easy to forget that our charge as nurses is to help women maximize their health, to arm women with the knowledge that they need to make the best decisions for themselves and their families, and then to support them in those decisions that they make. 
In 2018, we seem to be beginning to understand that women's health is not just about reproductive health. Certainly, sex and birth control and abortion are incredibly important topics, and trust me, I would love to talk about them on another event. Please invite me to do so. But in 2018, we're finally expanding our definition of women's health to reflect the fact that women get heart disease, women get cancer, dementia, women are the subject of violent episodes, and that these topics top causes of morbidity and mortality may look very different in women than they do in men, and they may need to be treated differently in women than they do in men. We're also realizing that there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all when it comes to women's health. Individual women may be as different from each other as they are from their male counterparts. In academia, we are using the term intersectionality to reflect the many identities that collectively influence people's experiences of illness and health. What this means is that women's identities are not simply about being women. Our ethnicity, our age, our socioeconomic status, our sexual orientation, our gender identity, our immigration status, our disability status, all of these things combine to influence our ability to successfully access and receive health care. Given the growing appreciation for this holistic view of women and women's health, it is fitting today that we're going to hear from three of the brilliant faculty members at NYU Myers. All of them are doing research in very disparate areas of women's health. Dr. Victoria Von Dixon will speak about interventions to reduce cardiac health disparities among women. Dr. John Merriman will speak about the incidence of cognitive changes among women with breast cancer and possible interventions to reduce them. And Dr. Marilyn Summers will speak about the interfaith, interface excuse me, of health and forensic science in diverse groups of women after sexual assault. Together, we hope that they will begin to paint a picture of the complex health needs of women and some of the innovative ways that nurse researchers are thinking about gender and health equity at Myers. They will each speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and then I invite all of you to ask a lot of questions. We've given everyone a three by five index card, so please ask a question, write it down, and we'll collect them as we go along, and we're really hoping to have a robust conversation at the end. So thank you again so much for being here. Thank you for supporting nursing and for supporting NYU Myers College of Nursing. And without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Victoria Dixon. So thank you, Carolyn. And that was a great uh, segue introduction to the wonderful topics that we'll, we'll share with you today. And it is indeed my pleasure to join NYU alumni, family, and friends and talk about our research, which is really aiming to improve health outcomes in women with or at risk for cardiovascular disease. So it may be surprising to you to learn that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women in the United States. Heart disease kills more women than the next three leading causes of death combined. Alarmingly, in the United States, every 80 seconds, a woman will die from heart disease or stroke. And much of the, many of these um, uh, deaths can be, are preventable. So in the time that I have with you today, which is 13 minutes, <laughs> about 10 women uh, will die from heart disease. The challenge of heart disease in women is not, is not confined to the United States. It's a global epidemic. And indeed, uh, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death in women worldwide in developed countries and in emerging economies. The challenge of heart disease really is perplexing to me as cl a clinician and as researcher. There have been incredible innovative uh, gains in technology, new devices, new surgical procedures, new procedures for old surgery, surgeries, new uh, prescriptions, pharmacological medication, lots of great advances that have driven down the death rate from heart disease, except in women. And the disparities that we see in women with heart disease are further compounded and uh, increased in women of ethnic minority background. Ethnic minority women experience even higher risk for heart disease, in part due to complex comorbid conditions, uh, increased prevalence of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, that uh, in increases not only their risk, but uh, further makes outcomes even poorer. So there's higher rates of stroke and death in ethnic minority women. 
The reason for disparities in cardiovascular disease is multifactorial. And we see disparities between men and women, but we also see disparities within uh, populations of women. Some of these uh, reasons for disparities can be traced to physiological differences, anatomy of the heart, different cardiovascular functions between, uh, varied cardiovascular function between men and women, but also those increased risks that are behavioral or uh, psychosocial, which is really the focus of my research, looking at the biobehavioral and psychosocial factors that influence cardiovascular disease and outcomes. But unfortunately, some of this higher risk is also traced to treatment disparities. So our research really directly confronts health disparities through innovative interventions that focus on improving heart disease self-management, which is the cornerstone not only of clinical care, but also essential to prevention and the key to clinical outcomes, improving those health outcomes. Briefly, and I, I could speak for hours on this, but I'll be brief, self-management includes those behaviors that we should engage in every day to maintain our heart health. It also includes managing symptoms or managing in illness when they occur. And that includes not only recognizing symptoms related to one's heart, but taking action in a timely manner. So women with or at risk for heart disease face numerous challenges. We ask them to follow recommendations for heart healthy practices like following an appropriate heart healthy diet, um, adhering to exercise recommendations, not not smoking, having moderate alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. And for many women, this is, this, these are combined recommendations. So not only do we have to adhere to a heart healthy diet, but maybe our diabetic diet, et cetera, et cetera. So women face numerous challenges in adhering to heart healthy behaviors. And we ask them to change lifelong behaviors. We also ask them to monitor for symptoms related to a changing health status, thinking, be vigilant for heart health symptoms, and take action when they occur. But research has consistently shown that not only um, that women are less aware of heart disease risk, but also less aware of heart disease, heart attack symptoms. For example, 44 American women have heart disease, but less than 30%, so less than a third, are aware of the symptoms of a heart attack. And especially concerning, I think, is the statistic that only about half will call 911 if they think they're experiencing a heart attack. But women, 80% will call 911 for someone else. So this sort of illustrates to all of us, I think, how um, where we have some gaps, not only in education and awareness, but also in our practice and our interventions. So to address this critical health challenge in women with heart disease, we've developed and tested an uh, innovative intervention, which we call Helping Women Help Themselves to Improve Heart Health, a community approach to self-management. It's focused on a decade's worth of work that we've looked at how do we improve self-care and self-management in persons with heart disease, especially those who are most vulnerable to poor outcomes. We started looking at um, persons with heart failure. We looked at uh, ethnic minority uh, individuals with heart failure, low literacy, those with low literacy, in order to develop our intervention. And through this decade of work, we've identified that in addition to um, uh, core knowledge about heart disease and heart disease risk, there's much more at, at stake. There's more that's needed. We need to Im improve skills and self-efficacy in each individual heart-healthy behavior. So in developing this intervention, we combined our work and uh, developed a community-based intervention that recruited women from uh, community and clinical settings. The intervention focused on skill building in the essential self-care behaviors that are so important. We focus on uh, activities where it would help to build self-efficacy or confidence in one's ability to engage in, in heart healthy behaviors. And we addressed a very important uh, aspect of heart health and self-management, which is often lacking. And that is that these, that our education, our um, interventions, need to be congruent with one's cultural preferences and social norms. So as we learned, we can't simply tell people what to do. We have to help them understand why it's important, teach them how to engage in these behaviors, but also make our interventions fit with one's lifestyle. So our intervention was funded uh, by the Signa World of Difference uh, 
World of Difference Award. We recruited 70 women with heart disease, as I said, from clinical and community centers, as well as through social media. Women participated in eight weekly group sessions that were led by a health educator, so a slightly different approach than a typical intervention. The intervention focused on building skill and in individual self-care behaviors and was individualized to the group needs. So depending on the knowledge levels, the experience, we adapted the learning needs and the exercises. In between sessions, women um, were practiced what they learned. So we gave them exercises uh, to do, not just physical activity exercises, but real uh, how-to exercises that focused on uh, eating a heart-healthy diet, developing a heart-healthy menu for their families. So we asked women to um, bring in and, uh, and think about fav family favorite recipes and how we could adapt them or help them adapt these recipes to be heart-healthy. So again, helping helping women as gatekeepers to the family start to build health, heart healthy practices for themselves as well as for those around them. We also focused on symptom awareness and we did that through reflection exercises and tracking of symptoms on a week by week basis. And what this did was help women to feel empowered not only to take control of their health but also to engage in more meaningful discussions with their providers around their health status and the symptoms that they were experiencing. Because we were located in the community, women had access to um, physical activity resources. What, several of our interventions took place at the YMCA, the others at the New York City Department for the Aging Senior Centers, both exceptional community resources. Women had the benefit of a personal health coach, fitness coach, to help them develop an exercise plan that fit their life. So did our intervention work? Um, we're, we're pleased to say yes. For the most part, uh, we had terrific success. We saw improvement in um, self-management behaviors. We had a module that we had added to this intervention on stress management that, that helped women identify intrinsic and extrinsic stressors and practice relaxation techniques. We were particularly thrilled because we were able to recruit a diverse sample, which is unusual in cardiovascular research. 66% of our sample were non-white, so we had a nice mix of the community of New York. We reflected New York. Women um, also, they were about 63 years of age, so this was the right target population. 60% were still working, which was a little bit surprising to us, um, but important because it, it that we captured the busy uh, work life of women. 27% uh, reported depressive symptoms and 50% lived alone. So when we started to put the pieces together and, and with our focus group feedback, we learned that indeed the intervention was successful, we were on the right track, but we still had a lot of work to do as far as stress management. Women told us that um, learning more about how to manage stress, manage work, life, health balance was really important. We learned that the intervention worked as women came together to build skill together, and as the quote on the slide illustrates, as they were supported by one another, they no longer felt isolated or alone. They had developed a peer support. And indeed, several of the, several of the groups actually kept on meeting after the intervention officially ended. So recognizing that we still needed to work in this area and being um, alerted that our tactics to stress management were still falling short, we, and, and there's an abundance of information and research that says stress is bad for your heart, so we need to, to focus on this. We've been partnering with the New York uh, School of Medicine Department of Population Health, Dr. Tanya Spruill, who's a clinical psychologist in an American Heart Association funded research project that's also supported by the Sarah Ross Soder Cardiovascular Disease uh, for Women's Center. And this is a a randomized control trial that pilots a telephone stress management mindfulness-based intervention. 144 women are um, randomized to the intervention or the control, and we're looking at outcomes that are important, not only stress, but quality of life. Uh, we're looking at depression, because remember, depression is, is problematic in our samples. And we're looking at sleep, because sleep, we know, is very important to heart health. The results are very promising. We've seen a uh, reduction in levels of stress, and we've been recently funded to adapt this to even to go upstream to pre-hypertension in Hispanic women. So more to, to come on that in the future. So in sum, I think our research really recognizes the challenges that women face 
in uh, engaging in heart health behaviors and in practicing self-management that can really um, improve some of those disparate heart health outcomes. Our approach and intervention content that takes place in the community recognizes that we need to go where women live and where women work and where they can um, be supported by their families, by their friends, by their neighborhoods. So our work does take place in those diverse uh, areas of New York City where um, women can then share their experiences with one another. The telephone-based stress management program also recognizes that we need to meet women where they are and, and that they do have very busy lives. So rather than having them come into a clinic, we need to be able to be innovative in caring for them in their, in their homes or in the, wherever they are. So we've learned that um, we've been able to leverage existing community resources, social supports, and in this way, we're empowering women to take control of their health and importantly, to help to share what they learn with others around them. Because I think we'd all agree that women are the gatekeepers of health for their families and also in many places for their communities. Um, so those are the steps that I'm taking to help to uh, remove some of the disparities related to heart disease in women. And uh, thank you. Thank you. We are going to move right away to Dr. John Merriman. Good morning. So I study um, cognitive impairment after diagnosis of breast cancer. And I just want to tell you a little bit about how I got to this field of research. Um, so when I was working clinically, um, I worked on a hemoc unit. And um, so we would give chemotherapy to patients, and they would be with us for a long period of time. And so um, they would bring in you know, books, magazines, uh, things they wanted to do over the period of time they were in the hospital. And some of them were completely able to do that, and some of them, I noticed, just weren't. And they would complain about, well, they'd read the same page over and over and over again and just couldn't absorb the information. So they were having trouble with paying attention with short-term memory. Um, and they were concerned about how they would feel when they went back into their lives, if, they, if these things would get better. So, you know, I only saw them as a clinician on the floor in the hospital, so I didn't know the answer to that question, what happens to the when they go out into the community, back to their lives. Um, so because I had this question, I decided to pursue a PhD in nursing, and then I did a postdoc. And long story short, the mentors I had for those experiences um, were studying cognitive impairment in women with breast cancer. So often, when you're training in research, um, you're research question um, gets uh, uh, molded somewhat by the mentors available to you. And uh, so I started down this, this path of looking at this phenomenon that I was interested in, in a, in a different population, but they had some similar risk factors. So women with breast cancer, um, while they don't have the same treatments exactly, they do, some of them do receive chemotherapy. Um, pretty much all of them receive surgery. So it's a, it's a it's a variable and pretty complex treatment trajectory for them. They'll get surgery, they may or may not get chemotherapy, they may or may not get radiation therapy, and then they may or may not get this long-term therapy that I'm particularly interested in that um, prevents recurrence, and I'll get to that in just a moment. So just a little bit of, um, of background on the phenomenon itself and, um, and uh, breast cancer itself. So, there are about a quarter million women diagnosed with breast, invasive breast cancer each year, and an additional about 60,000 women who are diagnosed with in situ um, cancer. And that just means it's, it's cancer, but it hasn't left the duct in which it started forming. Um, and uh, because of advances in treatment, because of um, those uh, things I just talked about, that relatively complex treatment trajectory, there are now about three and a half million women um, who had breast cancer who are alive today and who are, um, who are dealing, some of them, with significant quality of life issues. Um, so both Dr. Dorson and Dr. Dixon have pointed out uh, the importance of quality of life in, um, in, uh, in, in women, in women's health. And um, so for so women who are survivors of breast cancer, this quality of life becomes very important particularly in, in um, the context of um, return to work, returning to their social circles, um, et cetera. So those things that, that um, those of us who have not had to deal with cancer may struggle with just in our normal lives, these things are harder for them, for some of them. 
Um, so uh, cognitive problems, it's, it, depending on how you measure it, so there's a lot of different ways to measure cognitive problems, and I'm not going to get into detail on that, but I'll just say um, you can look at it with a person's self-report. So I think in nursing, self-report is particularly important. Um, on the floor, you're often asking your patients, you know, how are you doing? Um, how's your pain, et cetera? <laughs> so uh, coming at this from a nursing perspective, I found the self-reported uh, cognitive problems aspect particularly intriguing. And, and then a lot of my work has been around that. But there's also um, objective measurement of cognitive functioning using neuropsychological tests. And so that's just a, a, a fancy word for ways of determining where cognitive problems are. Is it with attention or memory? Is it with how fast people can perform tasks, et cetera? Um, and then there's brain imaging, which is a relatively new way of measuring cognitive problems. Um, so you can look at a person's brain function and brain structure. So these measures don't necessarily line up with each other. And Moreover, it's complex because not everyone experiences these problems. So it's not a universal experience. It's not if you get this treatment, you're definitely going to get cognitive problems, or if you get that treatment, you won't. Um, there's variability in the experience of these problems between treatments and even within treatments. So I just want to give you an example of um, what I'm talking about. So here you see uh, the trajectory of self-reported cognitive problems over 18 months of adjuvant therapy. So this is after surgery. They may or may, the women in the study may or may not be receiving chemo. Um, and then they're going to go into a long-term therapy called aromatase inhibitor therapy, which for postmenopausal women with breast cancer is uh, uh, an important therapy that prevents recurrence. Um, there's another therapy called tamoxifen that um, is pretty much equally effective, just has a different mechanism of action. So I think this figure is pretty boring. <laughs> so not much is going on here. So um, it looks pretty flat. I mean, so in this particular instrument, higher scores mean more frequent cognitive problems. And it looks like on average, women are doing pretty well. They're reporting pretty low levels of cognitive problems. But one thing, one of the things I've learned in research is it's not in the means, which this is a mean or an average. It's in the standard deviation. So it's in the variability around that mean. That is what's interesting. So you can use um, some statistical techniques to pull out what we call subgroups. And uh, subgroups, I think, are really interesting clinically. So we know when we see patients that uh, some of them, like I said, with the hemoc patients I worked with, didn't have any problems and some did. So those are two subgroups, right? And there may be divisions of those subgroups. So the ones who have problems, there may be different uh, subgroups even within that. So when we use a, a statistical technique to pull out subgroups, you'll see here that it's a lot more interesting. So you'll see that. The uh, good news is that three quarters of uh, the women in our study weren't having any cognitive problems. And that, that is probably the reason that, on average, it looked like not much was going on. But about a quarter of the women in the study were having cognitive problems. And it looks like for different reasons. So you can see here that uh, in this group in red, they seem to report, or they are reporting more frequent cognitive problems um, in the first six months of their therapy. And again, that could include chemotherapy, uh, but it's moving into this aromatase inhibitor therapy. Then it levels off and seems to get better. Whereas the group in blue here that's reporting more frequent cognitive problems comes into this experience uh, with more frequent cognitive problems and then it stays pretty flat. So you might wonder if perhaps there were pre-existing cognitive problems. Um, and you might, um, uh, say as well that their cognitive problems don't seem to be due to or in response to therapy, right? So the natural question is, what predicts membership in these groups? So there may be a lot of different factors. Um, I can tell you from the, this study that we recently did with some of my colleagues at University of Pittsburgh, um, this group here, uh, what, did, what predicted risk of being in that group was uh, the receipt of chemotherapy plus aromatase inhibitor therapy. So that seems to make sense because it looks like it's responsive to therapy. And then um, baseline higher levels of depressive symptoms um, and uh, baseline neuropathic symptoms. So that's tingling and numbness in your fingers and toes. And that was a little bit surprising to us because uh, chemotherapy can cause neuropathic symptoms, but this was neuropathic symptoms before they started their chemotherapy. 
Um, so uh, with those three risk factors, clinically you might be able to say that a person's at risk of being having worse cognitive problems with therapy. Um, in this middle group here, this persistent cognitive problems group, what predicted membership in that group was uh, pre-existing um, pre anxiety and depressive symptoms. So at baseline, they're reporting higher levels of anxiety and higher levels of depressive symptoms. And again, um, it may be that, th that their cognitive problems were either pre-existing or uh, were related to their, their mood disturbances. Um, and so I think when you look at clinical predictors of these different subgroups of cognitive problems, it helps us understand how you might um, intervene with people. So uh, you might address their mood disturbance. You might address, um, uh, you might be able to educate them about the fact that since they're receiving certain treatments, they may want to look out for these uh, cognitive problems. So if a person is reporting cognitive problems, what do you do about it? Um, there is not a magic pill you can take to make it better. Um, people, researchers have looked at using psychostimulants like modafinil, but there's not really good evidence to suggest that, that solves the problem. But there are, there's, there is ongoing work with behavioral interventions, and uh, this is similar to some of the work that Dr. Dixon was talking about, using things like stress reduction, mindfulness, Etc. to uh, help people learn how to cope with stress. Um, you know, stress is a complicated phenomenon. It has both uh, psychological aspects to it and physical aspects to it. And all these treatments that uh, the women uh, in, our in our studies receive contribute, I think, to both. Contribute to um, physical stress on their bodies and psychological stress. So in my research, we're hoping to help them address stress using a mindfulness-based intervention as well. Um, the particular one we're using is called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And um, we're looking at whether that can, um, can reduce stress and uh, improve cognitive functioning. And we're using uh, brain imaging. And I just want to wrap up with why brain imaging is particularly exciting. So this is an older slide, but it's really um, a good example of uh, why brain imaging helps us understand why someone might report cognitive problems but then do fine on other measures of cognitive problems like neuropsych tests. So these are twins, these are identical twins. Um, the twin at the top, twin A, um, uh, is 60 years old, so her twin is as well. And um, <laughs> she, had she had been diagnosed with breast cancer and received chemotherapy, and she's currently on a drug called tamoxifen, um, which is this long-term treatment to, to uh, prevent recurrence. Very important treatment that in aromatase inhibitors. Um, so uh, what do you notice here different between them? So I can tell you before, before you think about this um, a little more, they're both doing, while they're in the scanner, they're both doing a task. So they're both having to perform a pretty complex uh, short-term memory task. And I can tell you that both of them did just as well, but the twin who um, had cancer was saying that she was having more trouble performing the task and was just having more trouble in general um, with cognitive problems in her life. So uh, what you might notice is that twin A, more of her brain is active when she's performing this task, task and so that may explain um, why uh, patients will tell us they have cognitive problems even when if you test them, they may perform normally. And there's more complexity and nuance to that issue, but I think this slide really gets at what might be going, going on for some people. So some other things that can be done include um, ruling out other problems that can cause cognitive impairment like anemia, um, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, uh, thyroid problems addressing sleep disorders, sleep disturbance, um, and of course addressing anxiety and depressive symptoms. And then um, other interventions besides mindfulness interventions might be helpful. So exercise shows a lot of promise. We know exercise increases blood flow to the brain. It reduces depressive symptoms. It uh, improves sleep disturbance in the general population and in a number of other populations. So it may very well be just as effective with our women with breast cancer. And then things like cognitive training that can be done in groups or using apps are also very effective. So I'll leave it at that.
Good morning. I'm so honored to be here. I'm a proud NYU alum. I received my master's degree in 1976, so I have some of my cohort who are perhaps graying a little bit like I am, uh, who were at NYU at the same time I was. Um, NYU really started me on my way. I worked at the medical center so as a new graduate. Um, and so I'm very dependent on what I learned through NYU, both with my clinical expertise and also with my uh, base, the basis in education. I first got interested in research here with the, working with the faculty as a master's student. Um, I think Carolyn really did a wonderful job setting the stage, and I'd like to circle back to some of the things that uh, Caroline talked about. Uh, this year, we are really at the midst of a, um, a number of events that are all moving together that tell us that we have to really rethink women's health when it comes to issues such as gender, sexual behavior, and violence. Um, watching the Bill Cosby trial unfold and thinking about the Me Too movement, I think made us all think perhaps in different ways about women's health. The CDC reports that sexual violence continues to increase uh, against women. 37% of women report some kind of sexual coercion, rape, or sexual violence in their lifetime. A third of women, that's a, that's a huge impact on human health. Um, issues about gender are very much in the forefront that are really going to affect how women feel about themselves. The, our main health government agency, the Health and Human Services, just in the last week or so has announced some initiatives on gender. I don't know if you've been reading in the paper, but they are, are proposing that we define gender in very specific ways. First of all, to look at the external appearance of people to determine whether they are male or female in this very strict gender binary way. And if that's confusing, then do genetic testing and let that determine what someone's, someone's gender is. Now, this is very problematic. There was a very eloquent uh, editorial in the New York Times about a young woman who uses the, uh, he, uh, the she and her pronouns, but she describes her uh, being born as um, what was named as a little baby girl. And at age two, she had to have a hernia operation. And during that operation, they discovered that she had testicles uh, internally. And her parents and the physicians discussed what her health should be, and they ended up uh, removing the testicles. And um, she grew up thinking of herself as a little girl. Fortunately, she had a nurse practitioner mother who was very <laughs> open about um, her life. But when they also did genetic testing, her genetics revealed XY, male genetic testing. So she's a very good example of why this very restrictive and prescriptive definition of gender might be, will be very uh, problematic for us. So thinking about women and women's health and who are women is, are, are very important issues now. Uh, thinking about the intersection with violence, I just have to mention that those vulnerable women who are trans women have um, instances of violence and rape up to 60%, which uh, the 37% rate for all women is high enough, but uh, there are some groups of people who are even more vulnerable. Now, what does that have to do with me and a program of research in sexual violence and injury after sexual assault? Um, I'm an injury scientist, and I was an injury practitioner. I worked in uh, surgical ICUs for a lot of years and took care of people who were, had all kinds of really terrible and serious injury. And I was asked at one point in a faculty role in Ohio to help raise money um, from various government agencies to start a sexual assault nurse examiner program. And this was 20 years ago. The nurses in the emergency department felt that they were the best people to provide the sexual assault examination. Um, in that particular emergency department, what would happen when someone who came in uh, 
uh, who said that they were raped, they would grab whatever resident was there to do the exam, and that was really not a successful caregiving experience for the women who came in. Um, so I was asked to help raise, I was good at getting money, so I was helped to write some grants to um, uh, set out these programs, and I realized that we don't really know much about the injury that occurs and what the injury means, and I got very interested in that. And so we developed a, 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 a registry to track all the injuries, and I began a program of research to try to understand those injuries. So we tracked the injuries that occurred after women did not consent uh, for sexual intercourse with sexual assault, and I began to enroll women after consensual intercourse to compare their injuries. Now that's a whole other story about how you enroll women after consensual <laughs> sexual intercourse, and I'll be glad to talk to you about it at the end because we. We could spend a, a couple hours doing that, but let me just say we had waiting lists of people to be in our study because women really were committed that this was important. So when women would have consensual intercourse, they would come in, we would examine them, and compare their records to people who were sexually assaulted. And what we found was a surprisingly high percentage of women were injured after consensual intercourse, about 50%, but it was, tended to be very mild injuries, a little bit of redness, maybe a little cut, but very, very little. Uh, and about 75% of women after rape had some degree of injury somewhere. But in doing our analyses, I realized that there was a very large difference in the, the women who, who self-identified as being black or African American and the women who self-identified as being white. The women who self-identified as being white had much higher, statistically significant higher, rates of injury than the women who self-identified as black. And that made no sense to me whatsoever, because there was no reason after both consensual, inter uh, consensual intercourse and rape, because it showed in both groups, for there to be that racial difference. And I began to watch some of the exams, and I never did the exams myself. I was an ICU nurse, so I was, you know how we get ICU, ED, well, I, I didn't do the emergency department stuff, I did the ICU stuff, but I watched some of the exams, and I realized that the contrast media, the, the dye that was used to help highlight the injuries was a really dark blue, um, navy blue, dark navy blue, and it worked very well in, in people with very pale skin, because you would wipe it on, it would attach to the areas of injury, you wipe it off with a little bit of lubricant, and those injuries just stand out, but with someone with a dark skin tone, the dark blue really didn't highlight much. So we're picking up a lot more injuries in the women with light skin than the dark skin. Now I still didn't know, is it just an inspection visual thing or are there actually some differences in properties of the skin at that point? But I thought, you know, this, this is really a problem. The reason it's so important is that if there are any people with law degrees in the room, as people move through the criminal justice system, whether it's right or wrong, the more injuries you have, the more you're likely to be able to move that through the court system and see somebody prosecuted. So if there's a group of women with dark skin who don't have their injuries identified, they're not going to have the same success that people with light skin have. Um, the, the, the analysis of that got really complicated because we had to figure out ways to actually quantify skin color. Um, but ultimately, when we ran the statistics, what we learned was that race has nothing to do with it. It's all about skin tone. Uh, we added a sample of 300 women from San Juan, Puerto Rico, found the same thing, that what drives the injury detection is the, um, the skin color, light or dark, versus uh, race ethnicity. So that left me with the question, what do I do about this consent issue? And really, what is consent? And I think, more broadly, that's an issue for a philosopher, perhaps, or someone who, I'm a very quantitative person, so it's probably ultimately not an issue for me. But what I'm able to do with the sample size, because I've done three, three large studies, so I have a sample of about 600 women after uh, consensual intercourse, and then I can match that with 600 women after sexual assault. And what I've, what I've done is now begin to look at patterns. And I found three flags that will suggest lack of consent that I think can be very helpful 
as we um, look at forensic data and try to figure out how the injury pattern matches the woman's narrative about what actually happened. And the three, the three things in these uh, large studies that I've done most recently, first of all, any kind of external tear uh, in the uh, genitalia, uh, that woman has a, a, a uh, twofold, the odds are twofold that she did not give consent. If the woman has internal bruising, that suggests a sevenfold, uh, the odds seven times that she did not give consent. And if she has anal injuries, that suggests the odds 20 times that she, that, um, she did not consent. So once you begin to look at these odds, it begins to provide evidence that the narrative that the woman discusses, which is evidence from a legal standpoint, matches the forensic injury, and it begins to give women a stronger platform to be able to talk about what happened to them, why it happened, and provide evidence. I, I do want to make the point, um, there's been some famous people who have said things about women's narratives, that that's just a woman's story and it's not evidence. That narrative, that discussion of what happened in a violent event is evidence. It's evidentiary. So um, I'm careful not to say the woman's story, because when you use the word story, it kind of sounds like you're making things up. But I think it's very important that we be very clear when we hear people talk about, well, that's he said, she said. No. That, that narrative is, is evidence of something that occurred and should be heavily weighed. So where do we go in the future here? Um, um, I've, I've done another wave of studies trying to understand, does skin actually vary? Um, are there properties in the skin that varies across skin color that might explain why people with light skin um, it have these injuries more than people with dark skin? So we're, we're working on that now. There is some uh, good work that says that people with very dark skin have an extra skin layer that may provide a little bit of protection, and that may be one of the reasons that the injury rates are so different. But I think that forensic techniques are the main problem. And so we are working to see if there are better ways to do the forensic exam that doesn't use a very dark dye that will put people with dark skin at, at, at disadvantage to identify injuries. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you uh, begin to think a little bit about this consent issue and, and how it affects our lives. We have children. and. Um, uh, how, how people consent and what that means ultimately, I think, is, is a very important part of uh, sexual behaviors and of um, living in this world. So, thank you. So I want to encourage everyone to write some questions, but maybe I will, um, and I'm not sure if someone should be coming around to collect your index cards, but I will start us off with a question. Um, first of all, I just want to say how proud I am to work with all of you, and um, as always, I'm so impressed by everything you do. So a couple of you talked about stress reduction and mindfulness, um, and I've been thinking a lot about um, the opioid epidemic. And I've been thinking a lot about this sort of epidemic of loneliness or hopelessness that a lot of us see as being the factor that perhaps is propelling people to want to numb themselves through the use of opioids and thinking about the way that the epidemic of loneliness and hopelessness might be, in fact, perpetuating lots of health problems by not taking care of ourselves. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, um, in your research, whether you're looking at connection to others. So are your participants in focus group environments? Are they working with other people, sharing their narrative about what is happening in their life? And how has that impacted their health outcomes, if at all? And how does that relate to mindfulness and stress reduction? Yeah, so, uh, so I'll start. So that's a, that's a great question. And um, so what we've learned is that, and my research over the last decade has really been taking place in New York City and in communities. And what I've learned across populations is that we are a huge, diverse 
area with the city, with neighborhoods, and lots and lots of people. But we're also are we can become very isolated, and uh, social isolation in individuals who have cardiovascular disease, in women who may be uh, isolated because they aren't connecting to community resources. The isolation um, can is not only a stressor, but can. Uh, can lead women and, and others to sort of hunker down. We joked about sheltering in place, but really <laughs> further isolating when they don't feel well, when they're not able to connect to their to their social connections. So maybe symptomatically, they're not able to get to their community center or to their friends um, or to get to get to a place where they can get pick up their medic everything from picking up their medications to to doing their grocery shopping. Um, so social isolation is a huge problem and does indeed influence self-management, which can influence um, health outcomes. So when I think of social isolation and lack of social support, I'm also very concerned about depressive symptoms and do we have an underlying um, depression that's not diagnosed? And surprisingly, a lot in my work, I found um, strong incidents of depressive symptoms and often undiagnosed depression. So someone will score with depression, depressive symptoms, indicator referral. John was talking about some of those instruments saying we should we should be thinking about depression in this individual, but they're not on medication. They're not seeing someone about that. So, um, so yes, uh, very, very connected. The mind and body are, uh, are very connected. From a mindfulness-based intervention perspective, we're focused more on stress, knowing that stress, anxiety, and depression are, are very interlinked. But John, I'm not sure in your work, I think we share a lot of the same mm -hmm. um, factors. So um, I will just, I don't want to restate everything Dr. Dixon just said because I think all that applies to uh, the population of women with breast cancer as well. Um, I'll just say that in my research we do use groups, it's group based, and um, uh, we do hear from the participants that they find that very meaningful once they get into it. It takes them a little while, a few weeks, to sort of feel comfortable with the other women and uh, learn together with them these techniques. but. Um, by the time it ends, they're looking for ways to stay connected. They're looking for other groups where they can continue to learn. Um, so I think that social isolation piece that you mentioned is very important. And I actually hadn't really thought uh, deeply about that, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. Any thoughts from your perspective on I social think sexual isolation? sexual intercourse is a very good remedy for social isolation. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm so glad she's the person talking about sex this year, <laughs> not me. <laughs> um, so we have a few questions here. Thank you so much for asking them. So a question regarding um, receiving quality health care. In addition to health care inequality for women, the inequality for women of color is even higher. What can we do to change the inequities that exist for women of color? I think one really important um, way is to make sure that we have practi practitioners that people feel comfortable seeing. Um, if, if you have practitioners that, that patients can relate to, it's, it's critically important. And when anyone who is an underrepresented minority is able to go see a practitioner who really understands their a person's background and um, um, where the person's coming from. I think that that immediately improves care. I think that's true with with sexual minorities. I think that's true with um, when you look at socioeconomics. If you have nurses and doctors who know what it's like to struggle and not have much, they're they're much more able to relate uh, to patients who are struggling with those things. So, the diversity of our workforce, I think, is really critical to help answer that issue. So I would just say briefly that um, this is a very important topic and could have its own talk in uh, cancer-related uh, um, outcomes. Um, women um, uh, who are identified as African American have uh, greater uh, mortality from breast cancer. They have higher rates of what's called triple negative breast cancer, which is um, just has less fewer treatment options. Um, and then they have uh, 
less access to services. And some of that is socioeconomic, and some of it is long-term problems, structural problems we have with, uh, with uh, racism in this country. So uh, again, this could be a whole talk, but I, I think those issues around race are very, very important. And if, if I may add, I, I mentioned that treatment disparities um, likely influence poor outcomes in women and then in subgroups in ethnic minority populations with women. And I should disclose that I'm a nurse practitioner and have been a nurse practitioner for over 30 years in primary care, so very focused on prevention. But I'm really disturbed to uh, know that women and uh, receive less preventive care, receive different types of treatment than men, and that women of color um, similarly have received disparities in treatment. Not every, uh, not every woman is fortunate to be in a city like New York or have access to a center of excellence like like NYU Langone or or others. There are many um, uh, many women who live in areas where healthcare access is um, is problematic or that providers are not problem are not are not available to help them. Um, I, I would add to what John and, and Lynn said in that, um, you know, our work in the community has helped women to, un, to find a voice, if you will, um, to think about how the questions that they might be uh, asking their provider, giving them some power back to ask um, their physician or their healthcare provider, or their nurse practitioner, not only about their risk, but about different treatment options, about problem solving. And that's work that I think needs some ongoing, um, needs to be continued. How, what's the best place? What's the best um, model? How do we train our healthcare providers across disciplines to be receptive and willing to engage in these kinds of conversations as well? Thank you. I, I would only add, um, and I agree with everything, that I've learned an incredible amount over the past few years from the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think one of the main lessons for me um, is that I really need to listen better. And so actively listening to other people, their experience, their desires, um, their needs has been a very sobering and important experience for me as a human as well as a healthcare provider. Um, and I certainly um, commend all of you for thinking about issues um, that affect all of us. My family always used to say, if anyone, if there's inequality for anyone, there's inequality for everyone. And it's kind of a great motto to think about as we care for our beautiful, diverse population here. Um, John, there's a question for you. And this question is around thinking about whether there's a possibility that the medicines that people are receiving for um, their cancer treatment is contributing to mental decline and dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is good evidence to suggest that chemotherapy can impact cognitive functioning. Um, uh, and even though this is a systemic therapy and may not cross the blood-brain barrier, it uh, is thought to um, impact cognitive functioning through um, increasing inflammation, systemic inflammation over the period of time that chemotherapy is received. Um, and long story short, that systemic inflammation is communicated to the brain, and the brain um, uh, has its own um, inflammatory uh, cytokines that can uh, damage neurons. That's one potential way. Um, other things, not just medicines, so radiation therapy can also increase uh, systemic inflammation, um, even though it's a, a local regional therapy. Um, and uh, then the surgery itself. So um, uh, surgery certainly can increase uh, local inflammation, and then there is uh, the anesthesia that can potentially impact cognitive functioning. So even in non-cancer populations, those who receive anesthesia, there's generally a period of time where cognitive functioning is a, is a bit poorer than it was before <coughs> the surgery, and it typically recurs. Um, the other thing I'd point out is that um, with these longer-term therapies, uh, the aromatase inhibitors, the tamoxifen, um, uh, with, the old, with older women with breast cancer, there are multiple versions of the aromatase inhibitors. And so if there are symptoms with one aromatase inhibitor, and not just uh, in particular cognitive problems, but there are other symptoms people can have, like joint pain, for example. That's a big one with aromatase inhibitors. But if there are symptoms with one, uh, people can try another. Because again, it's very important that people take these long-term therapies and not be scared away from them by potential side effects. Um, you know, they can change, potentially change therapies, and they can also, um, we're hoping with these interventions, uh, find ways to self-manage um, their symptoms so that they can continue to receive this um, uh, 
these life-saving therapies. We are out of time. There was one more question about whether there are research opportunities to be involved, and the answer is, of course there are. You can contact any of the people who are on the panel or take a look at our website and see some of the other research that people are doing at Myers College of Nursing, and our door is open, so please contact us. <laughs> I see the person saying, it's me, it's me, my question. Um, so I want to finish just by taking a minute to thank Dean Eileen, to thank the team that put this wonderful program together, but mostly just to thank all of you for your ongoing commitment to um, NYU, to NYU Myers, and to nursing. So thank you all so much, and have a wonderful, um, hopefully dry day out there. <laughs> for the nurses that are here today, we're giving continuing, continuing education credit for this uh, lecture today. So just stop by the registration desk outside and fill out the paperwork. Thank you.